You're watching KPRC 2 Plus. The Evidence Room is coming up next. Her son remained calm as the judge read the sentence, death by execution. Josue Flores was murdered last Tuesday on his way home from school. I had a nightmare the other night. It was so real. You just thought the world was dead. I told him I was crazy. Officers tell us Trujillo stabbed her boyfriend with stiletto heel shoes. Police say the suspect may be responsible for the murders of at least six women whose bodies have been found in or near the Acres Homes area. Defense attorneys had argued that Yates was legally insane and grossly psychotic when she drowned the children. One by one, they described the deaths of the alleged other eight victims of the convicted rail car killer. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode four of The Evidence Room. Today, we're talking about Anthony Allen Shore, Houston's so-called tourniquet killer. And I have a very special guest with us today, Barbara Magania Robertson. Barbara and I go way back. Barbara was an assignments manager for KPRC for many years, and you have a rather macabre connection to this serial killer. Tell us how long did you work for KPRC when you got this phone call? I was only 23, but I was already on the assignment desk. I was at KPRC from the time, uh, like 1990 to 2010 or nine, something like that. So um, I was here quite a long time. I had a lot of KPRC family members. I was at work one day. Um, it was the you know a summer day in Houston, and uh, right around noon, I was you know my job is to log the newscast to see what other newscasts um, what the stories are, and um, the phone rang. And that's how it all started. Say your name for the tape, Tony. Anthony Allen, sure. Okay. That was the tip number, right? It was the tip line. That's mm -hmm. exactly what it was called. Um, it lasted 37 minutes. So I used an FX box. That way I could tap into one of the college campus lines and it couldn't be traced. Right. I don't remember what I said. Basically, but who, I, did, who did you call? I talked to, crime, it wasn't Crime Stoppers. Crime Stoppers wouldn't give me the time of day. I want to say it was tips. The two, two, two tips, please, mm. news line, or something. Whatever it is, you call in with tips. Mm. And I changed my voice, and I remember telling him where to find her. I remember telling him her name was Ruby. I remember telling him her birthday. Do you, do you, do you remember uh, where you was talking to a male or female? You call? Honest to God, I don't recall. Okay. I, want, I want to say female, but I don't okay. recall. He called me and um, he said, I have a tip for you. And I said, okay, well, what's your tip? There's a serial killer on the loose. And I'll be honest with you, at that first you know, initial moment, I was just kind of listening to him half-heartedly um, because I'm trying to do my job. Yeah, and, people and, all the time call us with, I've got the secret to the universe in my back pocket. Uh, yeah. Absolutely, Elvis is at you know the local restaurant. <laughs> I mean, I've had it all. Yeah. And um, so when, you know, I go, okay, so there's a serial killer, is that what you're telling me? He says, yes. And um, I'm gonna tell you where you can find a body. Dana Sanchez. Right. I only got that name from the newspaper. She told me her name was Ruby. I said, okay, well, um, tell me about it. And he said, it's near Ritchie Road. And um, in my mind, Ritchie Road was in Pasadena. Um, and he was not referring to that Ritchie Road. He was referring to Ritchie Road on the north side um, off of I-45. This was like an area that was so overgrown with or trees and brush. You said where new and, uh, streets were cut or something? Yeah, they looked like they were putting in a new subdivision or something. The but there wasn't anything there, 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 just the there, just the streets. Okay. He was telling me how it was placed. I couldn't tell you for sure, I'd say probably 100 feet maybe off the, road. off the road. What really got my attention was halfway through the phone call, he was giving me clues. He was giving me that were unbeknownst to me at the time. He gave me a birth date. 
he gave me um, he gave me the name of a, a nickname. Um, he gave me a, an identification of a piece of jewelry. I had taken every identifiable thing I could think of. When I went to reach for my key map, uh, things completely changed because um, he said, don't reach for your key map. I knew right then and there he was watching me. I, I can't imagine the feeling that washed over you at that moment. It, that changed the entire course of the conversation because um, what he had just kind of relayed to me in facts, I am now completely tuned in and listening. This is the real deal. The guy's looking at me. Did you it, ask him, are you, where are you, where are you? Did you ask him? No, because I was too busy hiding behind a pole. It was a pillar um, that was on the assignments desk and I rolled my desk, uh, my chair around that. So in my mind, you know, anything for him not to be able to see me. Okay. And because I, I didn't want him to know that he freaked me out. And at that time I had a better recollection of, of approximately where it was. Yeah. And he now knows that I'm, you know, just really taking great notes and I'm, I'm getting all the information. I go back over a couple of the facts. Um, I want to know, um, how does he know this, you know? And so I'm starting to just let him talk and he tells me exactly how the body is in position. Um, and it was strange because he told me that she was going to be found with her legs a certain way. Um, she's going to be looking up to the sky. Um, he gave me so many details that in my mind, I knew I was talking to the person that either saw the body or committed the murder. I said, I'm speaking to the killer. I, I said, you, you know, you are the killer. And um, he had a such a, um, he had his aha moment. You could tell by the way he breathed, he was breathing on the phone. And um, when he, he knew then that he had me. He, he knew I believed him. That you were him, believing him. Yeah. That I believed him. Um, whatever he spoke was the truth. And, um, and I couldn't really know if he was still watching me, but I'm sure that my voice and the way I was looking, he understood that he 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 made he delivered his message, and I understood it loud and clear. And there was a part of me that just wanted to be caught and stopped. He wanted me to um, to pay attention so that I would send detectives to her and send a TV crew, and he can get his um, you know his his moment. And I think that's what that was his get. I didn't set out the killer. That was not my intent. Mm -hmm. But. It got out of hand. As you end this call, do you, do you immediately call police or do you go to the news director? I mean, what did you do? There was a producer um, right in front of me and that I had worked with for years. And I said, that was the strangest call I've ever taken on the assignments desk. And she says, that's saying something. That, that turned out to be the understatement of the year, I think. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I called Harris County and I said, I, ha I, I have something for you. It's a strange one, and, but they, they never doubted me because I had such a good relationship. Yeah, you knew them from, I knew yeah. all of them. And um, I said, look, you know, and then my journalism kicked in because I said, I'm not going to give this to anybody else. You cannot, you know, put this on the scanner. At that time I had really long hair. I thought I looked good. Maybe I just looked like a freak. I don't know. You know, when I hung up the phone with him, it, it was just a matter of minutes. We, um, that journalism kicked in. I put my chopper up. Uh, we sent a crew on the ground and the detectives were already en route. Uh, and then I get the phone call within, I mean, within 20 minutes, I get the phone call, Barbara, we found a body exactly like you described it. So it was to a T. Beyond a T because I was able to give him directions the way he, Anthony Allen Shore gave me directions and they found it in, within minutes. Who was, who was the body? Dana Sanchez. And that was in 1995? That's summer of 1995. Okay. And she was found in a way that, um, you know, no, no family member should, should be described how that family, how that loved one was found. Um, but it, it, he was in such detail, Robert. Um, it's exactly how he described how she was found. At this point, I was almost in like a state of shock or dream state. I just, I wanted to stop. I didn't want to keep doing that. What was going on? I couldn't, I just knew that I couldn't get caught, but I wanted it to stop. I, I can't imagine going home that night. You felt good. It was a long day, and news, news days are typically long, mm -hmm. um, but they had to send someone to our studio to take my statement. 
it was strange because they sent the upper staff, up, upper uh, like the lieutenant, and they sent them here to take my statement. And um, and they were asking me if I was okay, and I, it still hadn't sunk in mm -hmm. in in that sense. Um, and then until um, that night when they said we're gonna we're gonna you know go home with you, we're gonna send, help you get to your apartment. That's when it sunk in. It kind of sunk in, but I'm still thinking they're just being nice to me because of uh, it, it was a strange day. It, it's not a typical work day for Barbara, and um, they I was friends with most of the detectives, so they they knew prior to me knowing the danger. I don't know what came over me. What kind of sickness? I freaked out. He wasn't caught until 2003, and we'll get into that in a minute. But that's a long eight years of this guy being out there. I can't imagine that a day went by during those eight years that for at least 30 seconds of every day, you didn't think about that. As it went on, the FBI had to get involved and um, Channel 2 was great. They, they changed my schedule a little bit um, so that to keep, you know, to keep me kind of safe in, in a way. Um, and the, the, most, the most drastic change is, is that personally, um, if I was like in a restaurant and you're waiting for a table and you would hear voices, you know, other people's conversations, and you, and you can be completely talking, you and I could be completely talking, but if I heard a voice, I would stop, completely stop in my track and look over to, to hear that one voice just to make sure that I can outrule it or I can say, that's him. And um, it So if it you was, heard anything that was similar, you would, it would stop you? It would stop me, dead in my tracks, whatever I was doing. And that was for years. Well, yeah. I mean, did he ever contact you again after that day? We don't think so. Um, but he knew that I was working. I don't. I, at that time, I didn't work weekends. But somehow or another, he knew I was working on a Saturday morning. I had crazy. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. Crazy thoughts. I mean, I had. I don't know if you call them demons. People talk about voices in your head. Mm -hmm. I like other voices. It's almost like my own voice. Like there's a demon. I'd see some girl walking, and I'd invite her and then I'd have fantasy trips. Shore was nicknamed the tourniquet killer because he used homemade tourniquets to strangle his victims. His spree ran from 1986 to 1995. And this guy gets caught. Who, did you get the call? Because I know we were, now I was working at Channel 2 at that same time as well, so we both, we both were in the newsroom. Who called you and finally, like, hey, do you remember eight years ago that person who called you and led you to a body? He's in handcuffs. Correct, I got a call and it was from a dear friend that is a retired detective now. And he got the phone call first, and he said, they just arrested Anthony Allen Shore. And, um, and his words to me completely kind of just, it, it stays with me to this day, because it was a very good friend. And he said, you tell Bill that he, he, he can rest now, and you can rest. And I said, thank you. And that was all, that was all the conversation was. But for me to take that did phone you, call. Did you feel better? No. I think it was a shock to, to much of the Houston region that this guy was a bona fide serial killer. Because like I said, no one really knew that there was a serial killer out there. And then when this guy gets caught, suddenly he starts confessing, not just to Dana Sanchez's murder in 1995, which turned out to be the last. It turns out he's killed, well, three young girls, one woman, sexually assaulted and nearly killed another teenager and then molested his own two daughters. And he starts confessing to all of this. First was Lori and Tremblay, Dana Sanchez. And the Diana Rebillar case, Rebillar, however you say it. Rebillar? Rebillar. She told me her name was Carmen. Talk about another case that y'all don't know about. Let's go back to the original phone call that I took. Mm -hmm. If you remember, I'm thinking that he's telling me details of one body that's gonna be found. But unbeknownst to me at that time, he's giving me all these clues because he wants to be known as a serial killer. And, and you have to remember, when he first started that conversation, he said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you where a body's at. There's a serial killer on the loose. He gave me that fact, and I gave it to you know, the, the detectives. Um, but unbeknownst to me, those facts were huge um, details 
in murder cases that were unsolved. And you have to remember, he murdered in different jurisdictions. So he was, um, he knew that if I told Harris County, maybe Harris County would pick up on those. If I told Houston, maybe Houston would pick up on those. But, you know, they had to talk to each other. And that's when the task force was eventually started. It's interesting because they didn't catch him because they eventually figured out who he was. It was because of his DNA that was taken when he molested his own two daughters. And that DNA finally came back as a match to one of the victims. And, and I don't remember the exact quote, but when he was arrested, when the detectives went up to him, he was not surprised. And I believe the quote was, what took you guys so long? I just wanted this whole thing to end. Yeah. That's why I'm talking to you now. That's it's over and I okay. want right. to make sure that nothing ever happens again. It was interesting, though, when I was listening to the confessions, he seemed to fight himself at one point because there was one teenage girl in here, and this, this to this day gives me nightmares, thinking that it was a young school girl that he saw he just wanted. So I had broken into the house. The door was unlocked, and I waited for her to get there, and she got there. She came in, and I wanted to prove to myself that I didn't have to take a life. And he let her go. But then he was kind of proud of himself that I didn't kill her. Well, there, look, see, I can combat the evil. It's like, what kind of thinking is that? He had a very um, sadistic mind where he tried to you know, please himself by saying, you're really a good person, but yet he was doing all these you know, horrible acts. And in talking with him in those 37 minutes, I could tell you that man was evil. I know he has four on his record, but there's, he's bound to have done more because I think he had an appetite for it. And the way he talked to me that day, it, it was part of his get, it was part of the game, it was part of his personality to keep at it. Okay, so when did he become the tourniquet killer? Because I mean, when you look, when, when you're in the county archives and you're going through the, the boxes of the trial exhibits, I mean, you can still see the, the tourniquets that he had fashioned there. So when did that all come out and he become known as the tourniquet killer? Um, I believe when the task force was created and they started looking at the evidence and how he progressed from using bamboo um, or a, tooth, a toothbrush um, to, to turn the, the tourniquet. Pencil or a paintbrush or something you use. Piece of wood, some kind of piece of wood. You use it as a... I don't know, what's the word, a tourniquet maybe? Or? Yeah. At Dana Sanchez's trial, which I got to testify at, um, Kelly Siegler, former uh, DA here, she talked about how the neck, um, the, the tourniquet you know, kept on making it small, that it was not even bigger than a fist, the neck portion. Oh, so and he had tightened the tourniquet so much that it shrunk her neck down that, to the size exactly, of the fist. Exactly, exactly. And, and, and this, wow, is, I didn't know that. No. this is the yeah. same guy who did these <clears throat> other murders. And I, I can remember working the Diana case, the, uh, the, the nine-year-old, um, as you know, on the assignment desk. And at that time, it was kind of like, who would do this to a nine-year-old girl? That was a freaky, that's the sickest, I don't understand exactly. Too young, not developed, that was an opportunity. I remember going in and, and I was so um, I was so grateful for the friendships that I had with all the detectives because I saw them come in one by one when I was testifying and um, they they came in as a show of support um, and I was very thankful and Kelly Siegler and I are still friends to this day um, the because prosecutor. the prosecutor yeah. at the mm -hmm. time um, you know we're still friends and um, I uh, this is a strange thing but this is how weird Anthony Allen Shore was you know at the ta defense table it's his lawyer and then it's an empty chair and then it's Anthony Allen Shore oh, so his own attorney didn't want to sit his next own, to him his own attorney put a chair between him and Anthony Allen Shore um, because he was just that weird of a man. He perfected his way of murdering these women because of the fact that he could not um, on that using the nylon it, it was it, it got in his words I believe he described it as it just wasn't working and so he used something that because I believe he also had cut himself on that first one. I just kept saying man this gotta stop. I'm a sick sick puppy. The murder he did not like how long it took. 
And so he had a, um, in a really sick way, he had to perfect his ways to be able to complete these murders that he was, he was known for. So, oh my God. Okay. So, um, the thing that always kind of amazes me about guys like this. So he's out there from 1986 to 1995. He murders three young girls, one young woman, nearly murders another one after torturing and raping her. But yet he's living his life. He had, he had been married a couple of times. He was in a rock band. I mean, there was video of him in a, in a band. And they even put like a cassette together. There was like a list of songs and in, in everything. And I mean, it's like, how, how do people live these dual lives? He's sadistic. He's not you and I. We can't even think about that kind of evil. Um, but you have to also remember that, you know, I'm a strong personality. I have great confidence. I come from a great support system, mm -hmm. loving husband, great family. And, um, and I, hate to, I hate to admit, but he was in my mind often in those years because we had eight years of a guy calling you and not knowing who that person was but, but he knowing has, they he, he was he a murderer so many details about me and um so it was just it, it was just it, it was unsettling I think to it, say the least i think at one point you had told me the only time you could ever sleep was you had to go to your parents ranch i was just down the down the road from them you know and i would go down and down to my mom and dad's and I would sleep and it was the most um, blissful sleep because I didn't have to worry about a thing on the ranch. I mean, it's not a big shock with this guy. He also had a massive porn addiction. Like they found all these pornographic deals. They pulled his, you know, search history on his browser and it was just, he had this. He um, wanted to see a picture of me before I testified so that he can control himself in the courtroom. He said that? Not to me. Well, no, yes. but one of the detectives told you that. And I haven't talked about that. Well, my husband knew. Right. Yeah. Oh my God, I'm sorry, Barb. I didn't know that. Jesus. Um, so after you testified, and I mean, it wasn't, I mean, he confessed everything, so it wasn't a guilt or innocence deal. I mean, Correct. You know, I mean, after, you, after you testified, did you feel better? Oh, absolutely, I felt better. But I wasn't, I was not done until January when he was executed. Anthony Allen Shore's voice quivered a bit as he apologized to the families of his victims. He then wished a friend happy birthday and told the warden he was ready to go. Shore was pronounced dead 13 minutes after the lethal injection was started. Tell me if this jives with the picture you have in your mind of this, this man. These were his very last words on earth. I would like to take a moment to say I'm sorry. No amount of words could ever undo what I've done to the family of my victims. I wish I could undo the past. It is what it is. God bless all of you. I will die with a clear conscience. That part got me. I made my peace. There is no others. I will like to wish a happy birthday to Barbara Carroll. Today is here birthday. I was very jumbled. I would like to especially thank those that have helped me. You know who you are. God bless everybody. Until we meet again, I'm ready, Warden. It is what it is, is the one thing that I always have um, kind of thought about, you know, who gives this man the right to say that, number one. And, um, you know, we have a good God. We have a great God. Um, so, and I'm not God. So he, whatever he thinks is up to him, but he did a lot of evil. He did a lot of evil. And if you go back to the very last word and he says, oh, I'm feeling that now. That's when the execution's going on. I remember. Do you mm -hmm. remember that? Ooh, wee. Ooh, yeah. wee. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It really does burn. Yep. You know, I, and at my mind, that quote came to mind after I, knew he was executed because it's kind of like, I wonder what Dana said. I wonder, you know, how she pleaded for her, her life. I wonder what Diana said. Did she plead for her life? Today is about Dana, Diana, Maria, and Lori. Holding up pictures of the three girls and one woman sure raped, tortured, and killed along with an obscured picture of a fifth victim who managed to survive. Andy Kahn said today was not about their killer but about their families finding peace. It has taken over 20 years for the victims' families to finally reach some pinnacle of justice. Now, you had said that um, you, you, you thought there were more out there. He, sw and I know this is weird, but his final statement, he said there were no more. 
that, that that was it, that he had confessed to everything. That was, those were his last words before his execution. The appetite of how he went after his victims and the way that he um, was at, at the trial even, um, going all the way back to that phone call, um, I, I, I can't imagine that he was satisfied with just four as his victims. And, um, and I, don't, I don't know, I'm not a detective, but I've always thought that he had more out there because there's too long of time between the twos, between the four, and, I, and what did he do for eight years? A couple of the crime scene videos are still at the county archives. The yes. trial exhibits, those were god awful. I mean, those were truly gone off. I was able to see some of the evidence and, um, you know, being described in that conversation about the tourniquet style and how her body was going to be found, um, those are details that are going to always be with me. But when you actually go and see some of the um, evidence that they had against Anthony Allen Shore, it kind of, you know, puts everything it's not a puzzle that I want to do, but it puts all the pieces together. And um, Anthony Allen Shore was a monster. Barb, you and I have known each other for more than two decades, and you know I love you. So thank you for being here, even though it's not a great subject to, to do it. But thank you for, for, for doing this with us. I want to thank you and, and KPRC. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, when the phone call came in, KPRC kind of protected me. I was the young 23-year-old, so I do appreciate that. And I do want to thank you, Robert, because through the years, not everybody remembers a Anthony Allen Shore, um, but I do. I did every day, of, you know, for, for quite some time. Um, and I could always call you and you would always give me the, you know, the straight up answer or what you knew at the time. Um, you were, you never held back. So I, I appreciate that. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. Anyway, and again, thank you for being here. Thank you for joining us. That's going to be it for episode four of the Evidence Room. We stream exclusively on KPRC 2 Plus every Wednesday at 630. Another episode is next week. Take care.